Good evening and a very warm welcome to you and thank you so much for joining us with this special uh, current affairs of broadcast where today we'll be speaking to His Excellency uh, Jobst von Kirschman from the EU. Uh, of course, appreciating the significance of uh, EU Day, but more importantly, uh, the European Union's engagements with Zimbabwe and the continent at large. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much for taking the time to host us this day. Good evening. How are you, Fry? Thank you so much. Um, let's start off with appreciating the significance of Europe Day. Well, Europe Day uh, for us is a great moment every year. We were just celebrating it last week. It's a moment where actually, uh, I would say, the, the European Union started. And that goes back to 1950. Now, if you look in Europe, uh, 1950 is five years after the end of the Second World War. So, so you, ha you have to imagine that countries, countries which lost 50 million people, it's not 5,000, it's 50 million, entire families gone, brothers, uh, fathers, uh, uh, sons gone, and in that you, you are still impregnated by that, you still have the emotions, and you sit around a table and you say, it can't go on like that. Uh, and that Second World War came after the First World War, only uh, 20 years earlier. So, uh, so somehow people were saying, let's turn a page and let's look forward, and let's not focus anymore on what divides us, let's focus on what unites us. And here it started with, let's work together on steel, let's work together on coal, starts with business. And these countries were signing, the first countries were signing an agreement to move forward. And that has brought us over 70, 73 years of peace now. Uh, in 2012, we got actually the Peace Nobel Prize. Right. You might have heard that, for that model. Right. And we were saying, well, we actually share the same values. Uh, that's what unites us. Let's move forward together. And appreciating that the European Union comes together out of a necessity, as you highlight, to rebuild. Right? Uh, the, you also bring up the Industrial Revolution's significance during that particular period of time, and it's said 75 years of uh, peace and stability. What would you say is the current state of the European Union at the moment in fostering exactly those ethos? I think currently we still absolutely united in our values. I think uh, nothing has changed, whether it is uh, democracy, rule of law, peace as a number one, but also uh, our fight against climate change and for environment. All these are topics which are founding values. Yeah? And, uh, and what I have seen uh, recently in particular was the war in Ukraine. Uh, that has brought us closer together. I mean, uh, we, we have moved forward, in particular in defense policy, in a way we didn't for the last uh, 15 years, right. probably. Yeah? Right. And then also appreciating a, a current challenge that comes up around the issue of energy. You did bring up climate change, renewable energy as being the, tra the trajectory uh, being taken by the European Union. How is the current uh, situation in Europe affecting uh, the transition to renewable energy, but at the same time, the high cost? Now. First of all, obviously, you, you know very well that the war in Ukraine, uh, in, in particular for my home country, Germany, was quite a, uh, a slap in the face in the sense of that uh, all of a sudden gas delivery from Russia was an issue. And, uh, and some of the countries, like, like Germany, for example, were highly dependent on, on Russian gas. Also, probably, we thought that dependency is a way of uh, reducing tension. Because when you're dependent on each other, you, you probably, we, we thought that would help enormously in the relation. It didn't work out, didn't work out. So, uh, so now that situation, which in, at first glance looked like, oh my God, we have a big crisis, actually was like putting the foot on a gas pedal for renewable, for other forms of energy, et cetera. So I think what we see currently is a huge acceleration mm -hmm. in everything which is solar, uh, wind, right. and other forms right. uh, of energy. Mm -hmm. And of course, also uh, a diversification. And that includes Africa, by the way, yeah? because uh, obviously when you say, well, uh, I had one partner, but now I need others, when then you, the doors are open. Right. I'm glad that you do bring up Africa with regards uh, to uh, uh, the relationships, especially with diversification. Um, renewable energy being a key concern, climate change being the precursor, highlighting that change. Zimbabwe also currently finding itself as being Africa's largest holder of a lithium. 
Now that particular mineral resource contributing extensively towards the basic requirement for renewable energy to be sustainable. Where do we then see these sort of relationships tying in together to meet the requirement of the climate change transition in Europe, however, with the raw materials being readily available as they have been uh, in time immemorial in Africa? Now, lithium is not only, uh, I think, a crucial ingredient for, uh, for uh, solar panels, but I, I think that's probably silicium as well. But for batteries, of yes, course, yeah, exactly. I think that's the number one for batteries, which goes well beyond uh, uh, classic use of renewable energies. Talk about electric cars, Storage, for example. Exactly. Yeah, so, so there's much more to that. I, uh, I think we very recently got our act around that, and uh, maybe you have seen the communication on critical raw materials the European Union has issued. I think we will have a much more open approach to, to get critical raw materials worldwide, and that includes Africa. So, uh, so I think we started uh, looking into where could we get them from, where should we enter into discussions. Uh, and that comes obviously after a long period where we had basically, um, let's say, a kind of more difficult approach to, uh, to mining in particular. Because mining obviously has also uh, environmental issues, uh, has a lot of other issues. So, uh, so I think here we are in a phase of transition. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, in a couple of months' time we also start talking to Zimbabwe about uh, critical raw material. Right. Now, appreciating the significance of our transitional progression, uh, uh, the European Union also having recognized that the forward progression with regards to the position on sanctions in Zimbabwe clearly has changed. Help us understand what has contributed and necessitated towards a progressive relation uh, between Zimbabwe and the European Union going forward. I think our relationship is rich. Uh, our relationship uh, is not uh, uh, focusing on one single item. Uh, you mentioned sanctions. It's, it's, uh, it, it's focusing on trade. It's focusing on investment. It's focusing on working together in areas where we have shared values and interests. And that is health. Uh, that is definitely agriculture. Uh, education. Uh, it's, uh, it's in good governance. It's in, uh, in gender, I think gender we have seen a lot. And, and that basically comes all down to the National Development Strategy 1. I think uh, the, the government has put forward a very comprehensive strategy. And uh, we as a partner, we look at that and where we feel we can well work together, shared values, shared interests, I think we move forward. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it is also important to, to see the relationship with Zimbabwe under that angle. Uh, see it as a, as a uh, multifaceted relationship. Now also appreciating that a Vision 2030 is Zimbabwe's target to be able to reach a middle upper income uh, status, this surely should also be able to contribute towards uh, a social development. Understand, as you highlighted clearly earlier on, that there are a lot of social awareness drives uh, that the EU has currently been taking on. Briefly share with us a few of What is called social awareness? Uh, we will look at issues around health, we will look at issues around uh, um, uh, children, maternity, yeah. I mean, first of all, I think, uh, and I say this regularly, uh, the only ones who know what's best for Zimbabwe are Zimbabweans. Yeah? So uh, as we as European Union, we can just be a partner. And, and I think uh, we don't have a strategy for Zimbabwe. We don't have, uh, we don't believe uh, that is better than that. Uh, but we believe in uh, that Zimbabwe as a sovereign country uh, should have and has a good strategy to drive this agenda 2030. I think uh, that's a very ambitious agenda. I mean, if you look at the uh, national development strategy, it's an ambitious plan. And uh, becoming an upper middle income country in seven years, it's ambitious. What I think currently is probably then the single most important process in that is uh, the high-level forum, high-level dialogue on arrears clearance and debt resolution. Yes. Now, I would love people to touch on that. You recently had engagements around that particular area of Zimbabwe, trying to be able to make sure that it does balance its books. Uh, uh, where do we currently stand in relation to observance from the EU in that regard? Now, we, first of all, we play an active part uh, because we are co-chairing with the government a good governance track. But let, let me take it broader. Actually, for me, this is not limited 
to debt resolution or arrears clearance. It sounds very technical, actually. But if you look at it, that is a huge pro process. It has three tracks. One on economy, tackling all the issues on macroeconomic stability, on exchange rate issues. If you look at the, the, the matrix put forward by the government, it's about liberalization exchange rate, it's about uh, elimination of quasi-fiscal measures, et cetera, et cetera. So there is, everything is in it. If you look at good governance, uh, it, it tackles actually all the areas which are necessary for good governance. Uh, and on top of it, the government, based on NSD, NDS1, has proposed a system of measuring that based on international recognized indicators. Right. Mo Ibrahim, rule of law, yes. corruption perception index, plus sub-indicators. And on the, on the land issues, actually everything is on the table, from, from BPAS uh, to, to 99 years lease, to compensation issues, everything is in this process. You see how broad that is. And the government has chosen an inclusive formula. So in these meetings, you have civil society sitting, you have farmers sitting, you have uh, creditors sitting, you, you have stakeholders, partners sitting in these meetings. So I think that process in itself goes well beyond arrears clearance. Uh, it's it's uh, putting Zimbabwe right in the spotlight and putting Zimbabwe back uh, at a table, at an international table, as a respected member. I think that's what this is all about. And that's why I'm extremely pleased when I see how this is driven by His Excellency uh, President Manangagwa, but also by the, um, the, the champion is uh, President Adeshina from the African Development Bank yes. and uh, the former president of Mozambique, uh, President Chisano. Uh, I think making it fly high at such a level is a good thing and it's a good process. Right. Now, also speaking towards Zimbabwe being on the spotlight, we do find ourselves also being in an election year this particular period. When it comes to the preparatory process that the nation is taking so far under the observance of the EU, what then becomes your current position? Well, is, it's not under the observance okay, of the EU. <laughs> outside of the observance of the EU, in the purview of I, the EU. I, I think uh, when, when I listen to, uh, when I listen to the, the president, the vice president, the ministers, but also opposition leaders, I think everybody is talking about free, fair, peaceful, and inclusive elections. That's a great thing. I applaud everybody for that. Then, when it comes down to elections, at the end, it's the Zimbabweans deciding about their own faith. It's not the European Union or, or other partners. What we can do is, we can, do, we can make a small contribution to making an electoral environment more robust. We have done so uh, upon request on our, with our support to the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission, for example, so that they can fulfill their constitutional mandate with our support to civil society. Yeah? We, we will also support uh, training of polling agents in the different uh, parties, all political parties. That's a contribution we can do. If uh, His Excellency decides to invite us, which I think he will because he, the intention is there, uh, once the election are uh, proclaimed, yeah. probably later this month or in June, or, then obviously we stand ready as well to have an electoral observation mission. Right. Yeah, because that as well is then an outside party, a friend coming and saying uh, the elections had went like that. I think this is something which could potentially make an electoral environment more robust. All right. On that particular note, your Excellency, we will take a short break and be right back with more. Stay tuned.
Welcome back uh, to this uh, special uh, current affairs uh, broadcast where we're speaking to His uh, Excellency uh, Jobst von Kirschman uh, from the European Union, appreciating not only the significance uh, of a Europe Day, but also the importance of the relationship uh, between uh, the EU and uh, Zimbabwe. Now, before uh, we took the break, uh, you were highlighting extensively uh, the work that the EU has done uh, in engaging Zimbabwe. Now, briefly tell us a bit about uh, some of the projects. I am aware that uh, Kariba Dam, or Kariba Lake rather, uh, is a poor, notable area uh, where some work has uh, uh, been uh, taking place. Uh, share with us a bit more. Thanks, for I, I, I will start a bit with a big picture. Uh, so the EU here is working together with the EU member states. We have something which we call Team Europe. Yeah. And that include, includes, by the way, our, also our bank, uh, the European Investment Bank. You might not know, but it is the biggest bank in the world, actually. Yeah, and... Uh, we form a Team Europe. As Team Europe, we currently have ongoing projects for over $620 million. They're just running now. And it would be by far too long to go in all to that. But just to, to give you an idea of that. Um, starting with our bank, the European Investment Bank, uh, they have made available a, um, a lending scheme for the private sector. This is hugely successful. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's over eight years, so it allows people to invest and have a return of investment before they pay back, 8% yeah, interest rate. And uh, we have seen that that has been taken up a lot by agricultural, uh, by agricultural production, enormously. And it, it went so far, and now I will reveal you a secret today, that just yesterday I had a talk with our representative and we are looking into have a second one. Yeah? Because it's such a success and there's such an appetite of Zimbabwean companies to use that and to do more and to increase their productivity. I think there's a huge potential. Then uh, we are active in a lot of different areas, but I would in highlight two. And that is uh, what is coming for the next years. We have a huge initiative, $220 million on greener and climate smart agriculture. And that is about how can Zimbabwe be uh, uh, more resilient, more self-sufficient, and at the same time also increase exports. Uh, and that is in all agricultural products, it includes all horticulture products, it includes uh, livestock, includes everything based on the NDS-1. Uh, but that is a key initiative of ours, and it could range from having drought-resistant crops, uh, could be, uh, could be uh, different irrigation schemes, more, more, et cetera, et cetera, could be uh, modern, uh, modern machinery, you name it. Yeah? The second big one, very similar for over $200 million on gender. And uh, gender, because also, I mean, uh, if you look, the, the, uh, Zimbabwe is so committed to gender, it's the only country in the world where the president himself has signed a political compact against gender-based violence. So here we have shared values, shared interests. And then gender is, uh, is an issue which goes together with women empowerment. And, uh, and that in particular in rural areas. We come back to the first one, agriculture. How many women are working in the agricultural sector? So I think that is linked. Yeah, and these will be the two where we told them we call them Team Europe initiatives. They will go on for the next years to come. Brings me to a third aspect. And the third aspect is what we call Global Gateway. Global Gateway is a uh, 300 billion uh, European initiative to increase connectivity in the world. And connectivity could be uh, in terms of the real connectivity, roads, uh, bridges, etc. Could also be a virtual internet connectivity, but it also uh, includes uh, a much more uh, progressive approach to sustainability, renewable energy, uh, sustainable production, etc. And I'm very happy that here in Zimbabwe, uh, we have a flagship project, which is the Kariba Dam. The Kariba Dam connects uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe, and uh, it is, I think, a key dam for energy production for Zimbabwe. So we are the biggest donor 
in the Kariba Dam with over 100 million euros, so 120 million dollar now, and uh, and I must say that is a fantastic. Right, right. What would you say is necessitated towards the sustainability of such a venture? I think that's exactly what we are trying to do. If you look at the dam itself, why is it necessary to? rehabilitate dam is because uh, uh, the water which was going down in the, in the plunge pool is actually has has digged a hole and that's a danger for the foundations of the dam so we take this all out it's a huge endeavor and uh, we restabilize the entire foundations and uh, so I think that will be a, uh, that will be a major source for energy production, yeah, and also uh, links two countries in the region, Zambia and Zimbabwe. I do want to also just touch on uh, global gateways. Uh, you did also bring up uh, issues around uh, trade. I want to be able to appreciate what platforms you've also tapped into to be able to create linkages for uh, local uh, producers and manufacturers for export-related uh, uh, markets outside? Now, first of all, we have a trade agreement, you, you, you know that, uh, which we call the Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, I think that, will, that is a key agreement. And uh, sometimes I say, well, we are number one by our horticulture products. Uh, we have a volume of almost $600 million per year uh, on trade. But we could do so much more on that. See, uh, and, and that's why I come back to the investment facility of the European Development Bank. I think that is aiming at increasing productivity, in particular of companies in the agricultural sector. More berries, more citrus, more cut flowers, uh, more, more vegetables, etc. to the EU. So, so I think it combines self-reliance with the possibility for exporting. Right. At the same time, um, I have just initiated a 10 million euro program only for trade facilitation. Right. So we work on border posts, we work on, on uh, electronic systems because often it comes back down to paperwork. You know, you, if you have uh, 10 pages to fill, it's very cumbersome, you don't have the information. So we try to, to support the government to have a, a better and a more smoother system which allows much faster proceedings at the border that will increase trade. That uh, will also increase trade to, to the EU. So I think that is going in a, in a very good direction. And I hope during my time here, we're going to hit the 1 billion uh, euro mark in right. trade. In trade. <laughs> now, talking about that day, you've also made uh, the necessary measures to engage the 63rd Zimbabwe International Trade Fair. Uh, tell us a bit about what uh, motivated that, but more importantly, uh, what the outcomes were. Now, uh, um, I, I have looked at that, my staff came to me and said, well, we have this trade fair, sometimes we were participating. And I would say, well, I mean, that is a unique occasion. Uh, on one hand, it brings together a, a large number of stakeholders, of politicians, of uh, private sector, of uh, civil society, of youth. And at the same time, it's maybe also the possibility to showcase what the EU is doing in different sectors, what we offer directly to, to farmers, to the private sector. Why not showing it? Maybe explaining at that moment what you have to do in order to, to do trade with the EU. And uh, we never exhibited at that, at that fair, at ZITF. So I, my colleague said, wow, well, maybe we could do that. And I said, let's go for it. But let's go properly for it. Right. So we had a big stand, uh, 33 meters long, uh, where we were exposing a lot of the, the things we are doing. And there was a huge interest. And we won the first prize, by the way, uh, for the best international stand. So we were very proud. My team was very proud. And I think uh, that was the, not a one-off. I think that was a start to being a, a, a regular member of ZITF and a regular exhibitor as well. But there's one other thing I would like to do in the future, maybe 24, maybe 25. I would like to bring in European investors to the ZITF. Right. Because I think that could potentially be also a platform where you can have B2B and B2G. And uh, European companies coming, meeting Zimbabwean companies, meeting uh, maybe government uh, representatives explaining what the investment possibilities are. 
I think could be a very good thing. Okay. Now, Your Excellency, having appreciated how your tenure having just started, uh, looking at uh, more time that we are expecting you to be here in Zimbabwe, what would you say then would be the key strategic areas that we can look forward to as having contributed towards your legacy and time here in the country? I think I'm very pleased, I must say. I, I had a lot of cooperation as well from everybody. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have also managed to change the dialogue we are having. I think that's crucial. I think uh, there are much more open discussion. And, uh, and I say we, uh, we talk to each other uh, in a different way. We talk to each other not to tick a box. We talk to each other to, to understand, and we listen to the other to understand the other one. Yeah, uh, uh, somebody paraphrased that by saying, uh, uh, we have stopped talking about each other we talk to each other. And I think that is, that is a key because that builds trust, mm -hmm. mutual understanding, and I think that is the way forward. Right. Now, acknowledging that um, uh, with every endeavor comes an element of a legacy goal, what would you say then would be um, uh, a strategic or a clear objective that you see being able to leave uh, for your time uh, here in Zimbabwe? Now, I first of all think uh, we, in, in four years' time that when I look back, I could say that we did a, a humble comp contribution to uh, the Vision 2030. So, uh, but then more concretely, I think immediately, I really hope the elections will go well because that will be potentially and could be an accelerator for all processes. We were talking about the arrears clearance process. I think that's an accelerator uh, in the long term. I think, uh, I really hope that we can uh, intensify trade, investment, our dialogue, etc. And uh, when I look back that I could say I, I did a little contribution with my team to, to make things better and to increase the mutual understanding between Zimbabwe and the European Union. That's it. Now, Your Excellency, thank you so much for your time and once again uh, we do look forward to speaking to you again in future. Thanks a lot. It was a great pleasure. Thank Thanks. You so much. Well, that does bring us to the end of our discussions here. We definitely do look forward to being able to highlight more issues in light of the relationships between Zimbabwe and the European Union. For now, pleasant viewing and good night.